Amen. based on your public profession of faith and in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you in the Lord's house today. Would you stand with us? We're going to begin this morning with a good old southern gospel number, I'll Fly Away. Let's sing together, would you? Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore, I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away, when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away, when the shadows of this life have gone, i Like a bird from prison bars is full, I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away, when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away, just a few more weary days and then I'll shall never end. I'll fly away. I'll fly away. Oh, glory. I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. If you're going with us, give him some praise. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated this morning. We used to have a black fella come and preach over at Sinking Creek every once in a while. He sang that song, and he made you put your hands out like this when you sung that chorus, and sing, I'll Fly Away. And I thought, boy, I got too many dignified Baptists to try to pull that off today. <clears throat> We're glad you're here this morning. Glad you've come to the house of the Lord. We've come here for one reason. That's to worship our Lord and Savior this morning glorify his name. The other is to tell you the truth so that if you don't know him, you may know him today before you leave. We'd love that. We want to sing for you now, the choir does, for the Lord our God reigns. We hope you enjoy it.
Let the earth and heavens rejoice, for the Lord our God reigns. Every child of God lift your voice, for the Lord our God reigns. Jesus, Emmanuel, he has set us free. Hopeless souls reading to tell, for the Lord our God reigns, for the Lord our God reigns. Every heart be filled with his life. For the Lord our God reigns. All the hopeless sins with delight. For the Lord our God reigns. Jesus, Emmanuel, He has set us free. Hopeless souls we need to tell. For the Lord our God reigns. For the Lord. job choir. We appreciate that. I know it's a blessing to you. Certainly was to me. And boy, seeing those folks in the baptismal pool, that's the great blessing as well. I appreciate the Har family. God's just done a great work over the last several years. And just nice to see uh, that Miss Ava come to Jesus and Daddy following in believers' baptism. Nothing much sweeter than that. I love seeing God do work in our families. I'm glad you're here. I'm excited that you're here this morning. Excited to share God's word. And uh, have you seen, I did not wear any sun protection yesterday at the car show. And so I'm glowing, and I don't need these lights to help me out with that. I'm telling you, I'm glowing. Somebody would think if you're married to somebody that works in dermatology, they'd put a little sunscreen on. But I didn't get the memo. But anyways, I've been fussed at. Uh, but it was great. And you know what's even better is seeing some of you all I saw yesterday at visiting with us this morning from the car show. And so thank you for being here. And then I'm just sitting here smiling, listening to the choir and seeing some new families coming in and visitors. So thank you for being with us today. It's such a blessing. We love our home folks, but boy, we get excited to see God bringing some new folks our way too. If you're here to support the baptism, we're thankful that you're here. If you're just visiting, you're looking for a church home, I'd just like to go ahead and put our endorsement on this place and say, give us a, give us a try. We'd do our very best to help you and point you to Jesus and encourage you to help us worship our God. That's why we're here. And again, great day yesterday. I don't know. Uh, I don't know exactly if people knows how to count right or not. But someone told me they had about 134 cars. That's a lot of cars. All I know that's somebody that did a whole lot of work to shine them things up and get them down here. And uh, they were beautiful. I appreciate all that and all the hard work. It was a fun day. And on top of that, Rusty did a tremendous job in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm praying that uh, that will be seeds that find a good good resting place and good soil and 
and bring somebody to faith in Christ. That's why we do everything we do around here. Uh, you can have fun and enjoy Jesus at the same time. And I think yesterday was the day that we proved that. Uh, also want to ask you to pray for Rusty. Rusty's uh, at this morning. He's at uh, Riverside there in Lynn Valley. He'll be sharing his testimony. He'll be back with us tonight. And so I'm just praying that God would do a couple of things. Reach people for Jesus, but also maybe to encourage some churches that's been through a difficult season. And so I know God can use Rusty this morning as he shares his testimony, how God miraculously saved him and brought him through COVID, not once but twice. And so God's done a great work in his life, and he's got something to share about there. Also, I would like to just uh, say as you pray for him, pray for Craig Hicks. He had a pretty major surgery on bicep and and also his uh, rotator cuff had several tears. They said it was more extensive when they got in there than they thought it would be. And so pray that he has a speedy recovery. I know he'd appreciate that. And I look back there and I see Wendy. Wendy, it's a big day tomorrow. And so pray for her back surgery tomorrow. Pray that she does well and uh, gets back to doing life the way she wants to. So our prayers are with you. And then we're all sad and we've been praying for the McReynolds family over there at Scott Price's church. Uh, their music leader, I think it's his son, and uh, he passed, and so we want to pray for that family. We want to pray for that church family. I know they've went through a, a long time of praying and trusting, and, and so just ask the Lord to comfort them this morning. I know they would greatly covet and appreciate your prayers, and I understand you're here. You've come to worship the Lord, but we also come for help from the Lord. There's not a one of us here don't need a touch of God in their life. We go through things. We went through things. I've been preaching on Wednesday night. I think it's important. We went through on Wednesday night about a psalm from a godly old gentleman. He talked about the aged years and the difficulties with growing older. And he talked about how much he needed the Lord and how it was an opportunity to extend his testimony, the goodness of God. And I'm here to convince you of that because many people walked out on Wednesday saying, Preacher, sometimes they said, I heard that sermon or I enjoyed that sermon. Most people walked out and said, I felt that sermon. Because you live down here, you're going to go through some stuff. But God's mighty good to take care of us all the way through. And I know you need Him this morning. We all need Him. If you're lost and undone, He's your greatest need. That's Jesus. So let's pray and ask the Lord to help us and ask the Lord to help us to worship Him. Father, thank you again for the privilege and the honor of being in the Lord's house on the Lord's day for the Lord's glory. Along with that, Lord, as we lift up hands and hearts and voices and minds to you and to your word to seek to do your will, God, we know that you're honored. But in that, Lord, there's great help. We can come and cast our petitions at your feet and know that you're well able to help us and minister to us as only you can. Lord, you love us and told us to cast our cares upon you. And so, God, we pray today would be a day of help and healing as we do our very best to lift up and magnify the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you be honored and glorified in everything that's taken place. Lord, draw us unto you, and when we walk out, let us know that it's been good to be in the house of the Lord because we've enjoyed your presence. We give this service to you in the great name of Jesus, and we ask it in your name. Amen. to him this morning, will you? In moments like these, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my hands. I lift up my hands to
hope you love him this morning with all your heart. Let's remain standing. That's the blessings on our offering. I'm going to say a few words, uh, and then I'll let Jamie say the prayer for you. It's good to feel the Lord's presence here with you all today. I'd just like to ask the Sunday school teachers, if you have someone who is not coming to your class or someone you know is, is traveling or just watching TV, watching it, give us your name. Put it in a little drop box over there next to Rusty's office, and we have some people that are willing to do house calls. Let's build our Sunday school back where it should be. And I'd appreciate that. And if there's anybody here, we have an opening in preschool for two, three, and four-year-olds. Come and see me or Pastor Jamie or Pastor Rusty or Pastor Reuben. Uh, we'd love to have you come and, and teach us, teach our children. Also, I'd like to say for those who are not coming to Sunday school, please come. We'd love to have you here. Also, we'd like to say if you want to join the choir, we could use you there also. There's so many things we need and so many things we want to have. Please be with us and join us and come to these classes and come to our choir. We'd love to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Jim. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless. Father, thank you again for the honor and privilege to make an investment in the kingdom of God, a great kingdom that's made an investment in our life for eternity's sake. Thank you for those who faithfully give week in and week out. I pray you bless them. Lord, would you take that which is given and use it to further your gospel and to extend your kingdom. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. morning. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> um, lucky for y'all, I'm not singing this morning. Um, I have asked Jamie and Sherry to sing this song for me. Um, the Lord brought me this song. Sorry. <laughs> Here in the middle of the night, one night. And the name of the song is, Yet Not I Up It To Christ In Me. Um, it was during a, a hard time. We've all gone through a very hard time this past year. Sorry, I'm shaking. <laughs> and um, some of my friends have lost uh, their parents. Uh, some have lost siblings. Um, Brother Jamie has been preaching on how this year how rough this year has been, 
but we have to stand firm in the Lord. Um, Sherry had asked me to share a little bit about my testimony about this song. Um, sorry. Back, I guess it was um, October or November. Sorry. Um, I hate speaking in front of people too, sorry. Um, I had both of my parents in the hospital. Um, my grandmother was about to pass away. And my sister was really sick. And the Lord just, it was like he woke me up in the middle of the night and um, he told me it was going to be okay <laughs> um, just know that no matter what you're going through as long as you have God and if you're saved and he is in your heart he will bless you even through the hard times and through the storms in your life. And you can't do it alone. You have to do it. That's why I love this song. It says, yet not I, it's not I that can do it alone. It's Christ in me. And a little bit of the song, it says, the night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For my side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. And just listen to the words to the song. It's, uh, it's really wonderful and it's been a blessing to me, and I literally listen to it almost daily. Uh, it gets me through every day and every hard circumstance in my life. And uh, God has just been good. And even through this year, we have blessings that we can keep looking at and keep going forward. And um, God will bless you. So I hope you enjoy it. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold. My hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. But I am not forsaken, for by my side, my Savior, He will stay. 
I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold. My sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me. Until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. And when the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me in me yet not i but through christ in me yet not i but through christ in me you so much. That was wonderful. Beautiful. Amanda, thank you for sharing your heart. Lydia, Bobby, I'm, I'm blessed that you're with us. It was a difficult year last year. Could have lost both of them. God's mighty good to us. Chinkapin's got so many success stories. Jamie, Sherry, thank you for sharing. What a beautiful, wonderful song. Pray it prepares our hearts to receive the word of God this morning. We're in Luke chapter number 22. Luke chapter number 22, we're leaving the upper room in Jerusalem and we're headed towards Gethsemane and um, we're, we're looking at yet, it's hard for me to even introduce this text, we're looking at yet another failure, Peter denying the Son of God, Jesus reveals that very difficult day in the life of Peter, but don't give up on Peter, don't throw him under the bus, all he needed was a little prayer from our Lord will make the difference. We're going to look at that this morning in failing the Son of God. Guys, could you bring me down just a little bit? I think I'm just a little loud. 
Luke chapter 22, I want to begin reading in verse number 31. If you found your place and you're able, I would invite you to stand with your copy of the Scriptures open. Let's honor and reverence the reading of God's holy, inerrant, infallible, inspired Word. Just want to look at verse 31 through 34 with you this morning. The Bible says in verse 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both unto prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Father, thank you again for the privilege and the honor of being here with the assignment to preach the word of the living God. You've laid this text heavy on our hearts, and I pray, Lord, that you would give us wisdom, unction, zeal, and anointing of the Spirit of God to preach the word in a way that you would be glorified and our lives would be changed. Lord, would you open up our hearts and our minds to receive the good word of God. Lord, we long to be changed for your glory. Have your way. Save those who are lost and convict and challenge all of us who are saved. Lord, we desire our lives to profit in you and your word. Lord, we give this service to you afresh and ask you to be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. I pray that you've remembered the last few weeks of sermons there in the upper room. And in our study, as we look through all this, I I read how the Lord here, as I gave to you, had revealed to Peter that the day wouldn't pass until he's denied our Lord three times. And the only thing that can come to my mind is, how in the world is this, is this possible? How could this be? I mean, first Judas was revealed as a traitor at the table. Then there was great strife over the disciples arguing about position and recognition in the kingdom of God. And now our Lord reveals that Peter... Their spokesman, their strong man, Peter, he would deny Christ. It's hard to fathom after just being in the upper room where they had were privileged to sit and to learn and to receive special revelation concerning the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. They learned in that evening a deeper, fuller, richer meaning of the price of our redemption purchased by the body and the blood of Christ on Calvary's cross. They heard him promise to celebrate with them again a glorious truth of the resurrection. I don't know if anybody gets that, but when Jesus said, I'll not henceforth drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it anew with you in my Father's house, that's good. That's as good as done. Jesus said, I got a cross, but I'll see you soon. He reminds them, and they they got to see that. They got to soak it in. The Lord had talked to them how he would celebrate celebrate with them again in his father's house. And then they learned and they experienced what true servanthood was and what it looked like from the greatest within the kingdom by the greatest of them got up and he girded himself and he took up a basin of water and he washed their feet, all of them. They got to see what true servanthood was about, not just heard it preached, but saw it practiced. And then he promised if they would continue with him there in the kingdom of God, they would enjoy God's kingdom. There would be crowns, there would be thrones, there would be special privileges. They got to connect up there in the upper room all the dots from old, all the dots from the teachings of the prophets of old and the teachings of the last and final prophet, the Lord Jesus. And there they concluded that he was the Messiah. And more important than him being the Messiah, they learned there in the upper room that he was their Messiah. He was their Savior. That they would be saved by the shedding of his blood, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They saw that. They knew that he was their sacrifice and their atonement for sin. So how could it be that Peter would now fail the Son of God? That he would openly deny Christ, not once, not twice, but three times. How could they have such sweet fellowship in an upper room with clear revelation of truth in one moment and the next become an absolute failure in Christ? Again, I I told you early, I'm not here to kick Peter under the bus because more times than not, I see myself in Peter than 
any other. And I've come to tell you, I'm going to fast forward in my sermon, I'll get there again, but I want to tell you that Peter's not the same after the resurrected Lord encounter with Peter. Yeah. I told you last week, you know, church is not perfect, but we need to follow hard after Christ. Because he said if we continue, we're going to get it. We're going to make it. And there will be a kingdom. There will be thrones. There will be crowns. There will be special privileges. So how in the world, after such an exciting evening in the upper room with Jesus, would there be a revelation that, Peter, you're going to fail me. You're going to deny me three times. Here's what I've learned. Here's what I'm learning. Here's what I've come to share with you. Many times after our greatest victories come our greatest battles. Does anybody know what I'm talking about this morning? Sometimes after your greatest spiritual victories, and there in the upper room had to be the pinnacle of their Christian life, comes some of our greatest blessings. Let me give you the text this morning as the Lord has given it to me. Verse 31 shows me the Lord preparing Peter for his most difficult season, his most difficult trial in his life. He says in verse 31 again, he said, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan desires to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Somebody put yourself in Peter's shoes right now. Somebody put yourself there finishing a wonderful night in the upper room. On your way to Gethsemane, Jesus turns to you and said, the devil wants you. I'd want to hide under his coat. The devil desires Peter to sift you as wheat. I don't know about you, but that scares me. That makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck. And all of this was Peter being prepared by the Lord and his omniscience. See, God knows in the person of Jesus, he knows the activity of Satan. But you and I, like the disciples of old, are oblivious to most of the activity of the devil. But we have an eye in the sky. We have one who never sleeps nor slumbers, who is always watching out for us, who is keeping watch over our souls. And while on the journey from the upper room to Gethsemane, our Lord lays this bombshell in the lap of Peter. All was not well. He needed to take advantage of what our Lord was saying. The Lord needed to get Peter's attention, and so he used a tactic to arrest his heart and his mind. How does he do that? By changing his name back to the former name. He says, Simon, Simon, can you please hang with me for the last two sermons? Jesus had just in the upper room put their heads back up in the ecclesiastical clouds and they were arguing who's going to be all that in the kingdom of God. I told you, I'm not going to give them a hard time because when you talk about a kingdom of God, an eternal kingdom, that one of these days we can leave all this garbage behind. And an unclouded day. I mean, that's going to be a great day. Everybody be happy over there. That's an improvement. <laughs> and then he talked about crowns. He talked about they could earn thrones, special privileges. No wonder they were strutting their stuff. The Lord brought them back down when he said, one among you is a traitor. And by the way, Peter, I know you said you'd follow me to prison or even death, but you'll deny me three times before the sun comes up in the morning. So most of us are oblivious to the real activity of Satan that's behind the scenes, but our Lord's not. And so our Lord said, Simon, Simon, and that did it. That's all he needed to do. That got Peter's attention. That alerted Peter to danger because Peter had walked with Jesus long enough that he knew when Jesus used his old name, he got his attention. It's kind of like when you're growing up and your mother called you by your full name. You, you knew she wouldn't wait till daddy gets home. She got your attention. Well, he's referring to his old name. And for you that don't know, the old name Simon meant wavering one. Wavering one. No wonder Jesus, when he came to him, renamed Peter. And he said, that's not a good name for you. Those who follow me don't need to be wavering and shifting like life's sand. You need to be like a rock. And he called him Peter, which stands for little rock. But how many of us know full well that when someone who is a disciple of Jesus starts behaving badly, when they start acting like the old man instead of the regenerated man? Y'all going to let me preach now? 
When somebody who is saved starts acting like somebody lost, how many of us understand that is a wide door open for the devil to come in and to wreak havoc upon your life? And so God got his attention that moment when he called him by the old man. Why? Because Peter obviously had been behaving like the former self instead of that which has come to Christ and give their life to him. Now, Peter's not the only one that does that. You and I have been around human nature all of our life. We have seen people give their life to the Lord Jesus. We have seen radical changes in their life. And then we know that the devil doesn't sit back in his reclining chair and leave you alone. There are opportunities, but be honest with you, he doesn't need to look very hard because we give him more opportunities than he needs, acting like the old man instead of the redeemed man. Somebody say amen. And this is what was taking place. The lost man that Peter once was had reared its head instead of the redeemed child of the living God. And so Jesus said, Simon, Simon. Why did he do that? He wanted to alert him to the danger that was coming. See, Peter didn't know that. I, I don't know what the devil's got in store. Today or tomorrow. But the Lord does. That's why we need to be sensitive to the word and the warning of the living God. He didn't know that, but Jesus did. And so he knows not only the activity of Satan that you and I can't know, but he knows the anticipation of Satan. And Jesus told Peter, the devil desires to have you that he may sift you as wheat. It is obvious from this text that Satan had had his eye on Peter for a very long time. He had been sizing him up, looking him up and down, if you will. Why? Because he must have known the great potential that God had in the life of Peter. And you know that's true. Because just in a short amount of time after the resurrection, on the day of Pentecost, that Peter was used to bring 3,000 souls to Christ. No wonder the devil was after him. No wonder the devil wanted to have him. No wonder the devil wanted to sift him as wheat. But then my mind runs back to the upper room and I wonder if the devil was wanting to do to him what he did to Judas, wonder what Judas was capable of in the kingdom of God. Boy, you talk about a wasted life. No wonder Jesus said it had been better if you had never been born than to have life and reject me. Boy, Satan hit him hard. The most trusted one among their band of disciples. They trusted him with the money. And yet the devil got to him. The Bible said entered into him. He chose the devil over Christ. But can you imagine? Can you imagine what Judas could have done? If he had surrendered his all to Jesus. What are you trying to say this morning? Here it is in a nutshell. Satan knows the potential that you have for Christ. And he goes after those who have great opportunity and potential to do something great for the kingdom of God. You don't understand his activity, but God does. You don't understand what he's anticipating, but God does and reveals to us. God's not in, I'm telling you, God reminded him that he desires to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. And he reminds us that with Peter, there is great potential in trust in Christ. And not just Peter, but for everyone who would come out after me. For those who would give their life to Christ, there is great potential in everyone created in the image of God and redeemed by the blood of God. You can do great, mighty things for Christ. But when you open the wide door for Satan by living like the old man instead of the redeemed man, you give an open door for Satan to destroy everything you could have been and could have done in the kingdom of God. Yeah, Satan, Satan's not interested. Hear me. Satan's not interested in those who do nothing for the kingdom of God. He don't have to lift a finger to get you. He's already got you. But for those who have a desire to do something great for the kingdom of God, you have a target on your back. Now, I'm not here to discourage you. I'm here to encourage you. You've got to stay with me for the rest of this sermon. But we need to know the truth. We have an adversary who's loud, loose, and looking. Peter said he learned. 
Hey, Peter got smart in the later years. And he wrote, he said, there's an adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He learned. He learned the hard way. And so Satan is desperate after those who would do great things for God. And Peter was certainly one of those. But I would like to also if you to understand only the perception of Christ. But verse 31 teaches us of the permission for Christ. That the devil desired to have Peter that he may sift him as wheat. And so Satan would want to have his way with Peter. He wanted to sift him as wheat. What does that mean? He wanted to have his way in order to reduce him down to nothing. And he was ineffective in the kingdom of God. Hear me well. That's Satan's desire for every child of God. He wants you, but somebody shout this morning, but he cannot have you. Because you are not his, you're bought with the price. You're owned by the Lord Jesus himself. He wants you bad, but he can't have you. But what he will do, if he gets a hold of you, he'll have his way and sift you as wheat, reduce you to nothing to make you ineffective in kingdom business. Many, many a Christian has been sifted and set on a shelf doing nothing for the kingdom of God. Don't let the devil have his way with you. He reminds them that's what he wants. He wants that in your life. Satan is powerful. He's able to sift his wheat. But he's not that powerful. To destroy you, he may sift you. But he cannot destroy you because that power doesn't belong to him. And by the way, somebody just get a little excited in this sad sermon to realize that everything, everything that Satan is able to do is by permission only. He is not all powerful. He's very powerful. Ladies and gentlemen, you're no match for the devil. You mark me different from those televangelists that said they want to swing out on, over hell on a wet noodle with a water pistol. Have at it. I understand I'm no match for the adversary, but I stand with Christ. And in him, I'm more than a conqueror. He's a defeated foe, and anything that comes my way must pass through the hands of the living God first. What does that mean? Even though it may be a time of sifting, even though it may be a time of difficulty, nothing comes to me that doesn't go through God's hands first. And Satan only operates by permission only. And yes, Peter was about to face one of the greatest, if the most greatest trial of his life, but remember the Lord allowed it. And so I can pout, I can whine, I can cry. Why am I being sifted? Why is the devil after me? Why is, why, why is this? happening well I can rejoice I can whine or I can rejoice because I know who's on top I know who's still seated on the throne of glory and I know whose I am and nothing comes to me that doesn't pass through him first so therefore whether I like it or not it is for my good and his glory and so Peter understood if the Lord allows it the Lord will use it to better us to strengthen us to sanctify us if you don't believe me ask Job you don't want to ask Job, just wait a little while and you'll see there's a better, stronger, more improved Peter after the resurrection of our Lord. You know, I, I used to get aggravated from the old timers when I was young and going through a tough time. They'd just look at you and say, well, you'll be stronger on the other end. What don't kill you is good for you. Y'all remember some of those sayings? You're like, oh. now you're old enough where you live through it and you understand. If it comes to us as a believer, they may mean for evil, but God means for good. And God promised us and pledged, Romans 8, 28, somebody needs to hear this this morning, that all things, did you hear that? All things, good, bad, and different, tragic, all things work together for good to them that love God. And to them who are called according to his purposes. If you're a child of God, just hang on. God's the only one I know can take lemons and make lemonade. God's the only one I know can make a terrible situation a way to profit your life and bring praise unto our God. That's what he's teaching us. So the Lord prepares Peter for the greatest trial of his life. And then verse 32, oh, this warms my heart. The Lord prays for Peter. Look at it. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And so I want to talk about the power of the Lord's prayers. They bring great assurance. You know, I, I'm thankful 
for a praying church. I, I, I don't. I, I know many people are here because you're a part of a praying church. I mean, those who know my story, I know we have new people coming in every week, and I praise God for that. I want to get to know you. I want to know your story. I want you to know my story. But I'm telling you right now, this man would not be sitting right here if it weren't for seven straight weeks of prayer around the altar that God prayed him home. When doctors said there's no way, God's people prayed. And my dad's here. Rusty's out on a preaching tour because you did it again. I mean, what's wrong with you folks? You just keep believing Jesus. You just keep praying when everybody else says you don't need to pray. You just keep trusting when doctors said there's no hope. What's wrong with you all? We've tapped into a well. We found out there's one greater. We found out that he loves his children, said, cast all your cares upon me. And I feel terrible because a few weeks ago, we did that, tar- that cardboard testimony. It was miracle after miracle after miracle, and we left out most. God's been mighty, mighty good to this church. And I love praying people. And I'm blessed to have a group that surrounds me that are called deacons that pray for me. Morning, noon, or night, something come up, I can pick up the phone. I don't have any qualms and I don't even have any doubts. I know they're going to come together and they're going to pray for me. They've proved it over and over again. I'm thankful for that. Matter of fact, if I had tragedy hit my Life right now, I'd have no problem to say, church, I need you. I need your prayers because I know I can depend on the praying, the prayers of God's people. But all that, as wonderful as it is, pales in comparison to the Lord Jesus himself praying for me, praying for you. Can you put yourself in Peter's shoes? How many times do you think that the devil's been after you? Oh, Lord, preacher. You don't know. He was at my house this morning. How many times do you think that the Lord Jesus has actually prayed for you is while you're still here? While you're still breathing? While you're still functioning? The Lord prayed that his faith fails not. And so this brings great assurance to our lives as a believer as it did Peter. You see the great conjunction between verses 31 and 32? The devil desires to have you, that he may sift you as we, but I have prayed for you, Jesus says. The prayers of Jesus is far greater than the plans of Satan. Somebody write that down. Put that in long term. Keep it with you. The prayers of Jesus are far greater than the plans of Satan. And as a believer in Christ Jesus, we have an advocate with the Father. We have an eternal high priest who ever lives to make intercession for us. And you can be sure and dead sure when he prays, they hit on target every time. Has there anybody ever come to an altar and said, man, I hope that prayer got through? (laughs) Lord, I sure hope you heard me. Lord, I'm desperately trying to get your attention. I feel like David in the psalm saying, Lord, please hear my cry and attend to my prayers. You you never have to cry out that when Jesus is praying. When God inside of you prays to God on the throne for you. When the son talks to his father, I promise you his prayers are on mark every single time. And somebody just needs to hear the word of God today. That When Satan's on the attack, our Lord is praying. He's praying for you. And so that's a wonderful truth. It's a powerful truth. It's an assuring truth. His prayers are always heard and therefore we will always receive the help that God would have us have. And so the products of the Lord's prayer is it produces an enduring faith. The Lord's prayer strengthened Peter's faith to the point that he would not fail. I've prayed for you that your faith doesn't fail. There would be a great time of testing. It would be a great trial. I'm I'm serious. I believe this time of sifting was probably the worst experience of Peter's Christian life. Dying on a cross, crucified upside down was probably not the worst. He was ready. I believe being sifted by the hand of Satan was the worst trial of his life. And yet he would be sifted He would go through the difficult trial, and yet his faith would not fail. His faith would win, and it would be stronger on the other side, and the experience would change him for the better. There are many of us who have been through the sifting process, if you call it. We don't want to go back through that for nothing, nor love, nor money. 
But on the other side, we understand that God strengthened us. And we may still have a difficult time to say, well, it was worth it, but it was worth it. What God brought us through and what God taught us, it produces an enduring faith. Why? Because you saw the hand of God bring you through such a terrible sifting time. You wouldn't turn your back on Him or forsake Him now for nothing because He brought you through that which have destroyed you. But He brought you through. See, your testimony is the same. It's got a great big conjunction there. Satan wanted me. Satan desired to sift me. But the Lord prayed for me. My faith did not fail. And I was strengthened on the other side. And it produced an exhorted family. This experience with Satan sifting Peter would be very, very painful. But because the Lord prayed for him, later it would be very profitable not only to Peter, but to those who are brothers in Christ with Peter. It would strengthen his brothers years to come. Especially, as I've already alluded to this morning twice, after the resurrection, we see a completely different Peter. We see a different man. We see a church in great debt of the ministry of Peter after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it took a painful sifting and a powerful prayer to make a true servant of the living God that makes a difference in the church of the living God. I'd like to say that one more time slowly. It takes a painful sifting experience and a powerful prayer to bring enduring faith that transforms not only his life, but the life of others and is a great blessing to the church of the living God. See, they heard what stewardship was in the upper room. They saw it demonstrated in the life of Jesus. But like you and I, there must be a time where we understand experientially what true servant Hood was. For Peter, that took a sifting and a praying that produced a true servant in the living God. The Bible teaches us also there was a foolish pledge of Peter. We'll get into details later in this text, but for now, look at verse 33 and 34. He said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both into prison or to death. And he said, I tell you, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Yeah, you ever been in one of those situations where it was revealed to you that things were not going to go just the way you had planned and you just went ahead and spoke up and wished you hadn't? <laughs> I'd say, I, I would say that Peter would have gave a million shekels. Didn't have dollars back then. A so million shekels. To have kept his mouth shut at this point. But he decided to go ahead and put his two cents in worth. And he makes a foolish pledge. He pledges his life and his loyalty to Christ. He said either prison or death. It didn't matter. And listen to me. Because right here is where Peter's usually discarded. And thrown under the bus and rolled over twice. But I believe with all of my heart that Peter meant that. Deep inside Peter. I, 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 I feel his loyalty. I feel his love. I really believe in his heart and his mind that he meant, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I've seen what you've done. I heard what you said. I've put it together. I know you keep talking about a cross, but you can count on me. Prison or death, it doesn't matter. I'm with you. I really believe in my heart that in his heart, he meant that. But. I think all of us have lived long enough in adult years to realize even though your heart means well, you can't always trust your heart. Somebody needs to understand that. You can talk a good game. You can mean it to the bottom of your soul. But yet you cannot trust your heart in time. And will you please hear me with confidence this morning when I tell you that God knows your heart better than you do. And there's really no need in arguing that. I mean, he meant that. He just could not see and he just could not understand what Jesus saw and what Jesus knew was coming for him. If, if Peter would have known what Satan had in store, if Peter would have known what Jesus knew and what Jesus saw, he would have never made this statement. So be careful because we can't see all. 
We don't know all. That's why we learn to depend and trust in the word and the wisdom of God. See, Peter didn't know that these attacks from Satan was coming and what it would reduce him to. He could not see his pride. He could not see his pride needed to be sifted. Now, do you think it's a mistake that Jesus in the beginning said, Simon, Simon? What's the difference between the wavering one and the rock? You, you know this. You learned it in the, in the flannel graphs. What's the difference between the wavering one and the rock? Well, the one puts their trust in themselves, sifting sand. One places their trust upon a rock that's solid. The storms will come and it'll never, never blow. You, you, you know what happened? You, you can put it together. You know what happened? Peter started trusting in Peter instead of Christ. And it's what Peter didn't understand because, boy, that can get ahead of you before you know it. Anybody give a testimony? That can get ahead of you before you know it. I'm doing all right. Now, no, you're not. Be careful when you say, I'm doing all right. Can I quote the song? You need him. You need him every hour. You need him more than your next breath. You need him more than you think you do. And so what Peter didn't understand was pride was rearing back up in his life. Hence, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, wavering one, wavering one. You say you're with me, but you're walking alone. Simon, Simon, the devil wants you. He wants to sift you as wheat. Why? Because he wanted to reduce the pride in his life. Do you understand you can't walk with Jesus and be proud? You can be proud of him, but not proud of you. That needed to go. That needed to go. And we've seen that was epidemic there in the upper room with all of them arguing who's going to be the greatest. And Peter was part of the all of them. And so pride had to be sifted out of his life. In the other Gospels, he claims that if all others fail you, I would not. If you don't tell me he's struggling with a bit of pride in his life, please read the other Gospels. Because Jesus shares this, and he's not the only silent one, and they all begin to say, no, 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 no. And so he steps up, and he says, let me tell you something, Lord. All these dirt bags. Sorry, that was a rough translation. All these goobers, they just talk a big game. That's not even a better translation, edit. Lord, you can't depend on them. You heard them arguing. He forgot he was part of that, you all. But Lord, if they all fail you, you said they would, you can count on me. When somebody starts talking like that, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. But listen to me, I, 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 just start backing up. Because there's a sifting coming. There's a sifting coming. Peter did not recognize it. Peter did not see it. But the Lord said it was essential. It was necessary. Hear the word of God because Peter would have done well to remember the wisdom of Solomon in, in Proverbs 16, 8 that said, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The sad truth is that Peter did not know his own heart. He did not understand his sinful pride, but it was an open door to the activity of the devil. He makes a pledge that, fails in loyalty to Christ. He said, don't, 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 please don't ever dismiss the word of God. If Jesus said that they're going to all scatter, remember what his prophecy was? He said, they're going to smite the shepherd and the sheep's going to scatter. If Jesus says that, why don't just write it down. Put it long term. But I'm not going to, trust me, if Jesus says you're going to scatter, you're going to scatter. And so Jesus gave them the warning that they would scatter and they did. And yes, even Peter, he said he wouldn't, but he did. And so when you hear the word and the warning of God about the activity of Satan and how he desires to have each and every one of us, let's not ignore that, ignore that, let's not ignore that warning. Let us not argue with God and tell him that we know better. Don't ever even look to the face of God and say, never me, not me. When God said there's an adversary out there that wants to chew you up and destroy you, he said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, but he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Say, yes, sir. Not me, Lord. No, never me. Maybe them, but not me. Don't, don't do that. Don't ignore the warning of God of our adversary's activity. Hear the word of God. Prepare yourself. He denied the Lord three times. Prideful Peter was struggling with the Lord's infinite wisdom, and so Peter did his thing, and Jesus went ahead and Gave him the painful details of his failure and his lack of loyalty, his folly. This day, he said, 
three times before dawn, before the rooster crows, you would deny me. And yet in spite of all these details, in spite of all the warning, Peter continued to argue and insist that he would not, that he would go to prison for him, he would even die for him. His badge of courage was death before dishonor. That was Peter's badge of courage, and yet he failed him three times before dawn. I know, and I'm closing, but I know that Peter seemed very, very noble, but it just wasn't true of Peter. See, God knew him better than he knew himself. He was arrogant, he was prideful, and he was foolish to argue with the infinite wisdom of the living God. Sure, Peter loved the Lord. I'll never take that from him. Are you listening to me? I get so tired and aggravated, to be honest with you, at Bible's teachers and preachers throwing Peter under the bus. Listen, we're not clay that Jesus throws away. Are you listening to me? We get broken. We get shattered. But we need to stay pliable and in the potter's hands. He places us back up on the wheel. A little water, the Holy Spirit, He remakes us as a trophy of God's grace. I'm not throwing Peter away. I'm just telling you he was prideful. He was ugly in his pride. He was arguing with the wisdom of God. He loved the Lord, though. He just did not understand his own frailties and his weaknesses brought on in his life by sinful pride. He didn't know the danger of pride. And here's the greatest marvel of the service this morning. We're all Peter's. God sees all of our ugly, wicked, sinful pride. And yet he loves us. That's why I keep coming back. You and you, he still loves me. He kept drawing me unto himself. He didn't run over Peter, why should you? He looked at Peter and all this and what did he do? Peter did his thing and Jesus did his. He went to a cross for Peter. Wow. I'm glad you weren't Jesus. You'd have smacked Peter around. You'd have thrown him off a cliff. Jesus went on to a cross. Oh, how he loves you. And oh, how he loves me. He went to a cross. When man was at his worst, God's still at his best. Peter's sin crossed. Peter's sin of pride cost him a lifetime of regret. But I want you to notice that it's not what's in our text. What's in our text, Jesus does not upbraid him. He does not write him off. He does not consider him useless creature and a broken reed. He loved him. He went to the cross to redeem him. He would die for him. He would resurrect for Peter. He would arrange a future meeting and take care of these things. And then he would forgive Peter. He would change Peter. And Peter would have peace Peace, finally, peace, and a new commission to strengthen the brethren and win lost souls to Christ. And boy, did Peter do it. Peter's now one of my great heroes. Maybe you'll confess to having some of the, made the same foolish mistakes in your life. Maybe you would confess to have been prideful and overconfident in your own flesh. You never thought that you would have stumbled so far away from Christ like Peter did. But there you are. Hear the word of God this morning. I tell you with great compassion and great passion this morning, He is not finished with you yet. He still loves you. He died to atone for your sin, to resurrect and give you redemption. He wants you. Yes, Satan does want you. I will not lie. I will not lie. Satan wants you desperately. He may can just sift his wheat, but some he may destroy. He wants you, but God wants you. God's loved you with an everlasting love. See, Satan wants to destroy and reduce you to nothing. But God loves you, wants to forgive you. And my favorite word is found over in Hosea chapter 14. When he looked at Israel full of pride and sin, and with a great big O your Bible starts with, it's a lamentation, it's a weep, it's a cry. But our God stands And looks to prideful, rebellious Israel and said, O Israel, return unto the Lord your God and take with you words. Confess your sin. And I will love you freely. No strings attached. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, peace, 
and make you efficient and successful in the kingdom of God. Boy, that's a good word. Won't you come to him? Won't you trust him? Father, thank you again for the privilege and honor to share your word. God, you've laid it heavy on my text, this heart, this text on my heart. Lord, I want to apply it to my life. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be profitable to the kingdom of God. Lord, I pray for my brothers and my sisters as well. But Lord, this lesson will not fall on deaf ears, but we will follow you. We'll hear your voice. We'll draw up to you. Because, of God, I'm confident we trust you that you'll pray for us. And our faith will not fail. It will endure. And it will be effective in the kingdom of God. Have your way in this place. God, save those who are lost. And those who are saved, challenge us. Encourage us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. God, speak to your heart. You come this morning. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, say, and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, Bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all along, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, say, and secure from all along, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning. On the everlasting arms. Amen. Amen. I want to ask you to be seated just a quick second. I want to ask the Hart family if they'll come right here just a quick second. And uh, I want to ask you to help me celebrate and rejoice in what God's doing. Um, I love this family. And, and to, to say that's really an understatement. I just appreciate, I, I said in a prayer, that I've been privileged to be able to see God work in all their lives and, and over the years. And that's a joy. 
But honestly, is there anything sweeter than seeing daddy and, and baby girl there in the baptistry pool? And we prayed. They've got one in the nursery. She's got the prettiest hair I've ever seen in my life, that little blonde curly hair. And we prayed that we get to see the day that she's able to testify before you that the Lord is hers. And so I love seeing God work in a family. And Miranda got saved and baptized back in 1989. She's been a member here at the church. And Grady got saved sometime back and wanted to be a member of the church here. It was follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Ava just got saved last week and follow the Lord in believer's baptism. And so I want to present them to you uh, for membership. And so what's the pleasure we received Grady and Ava this morning in membership? All right, is there a second? All in favor, would you raise a hand and say, praise the Lord. God's been mighty, mighty good. And so after the service, you can come by and just let them know you love them and give them a word of encouragement and uh, pray there's more of that to come. And so you guys can hang out right here just a quick second. And uh, I'm, I'm, I know we got deacons meeting tonight. And also, uh, Nick wanted me to ask. I'll, I'll do that. Nick said anybody that wants to help with the video side of that that would be interested in learning, holler at him. Nick Wave, he's that guy right there. And so nobody got to turn around and look at you. Well, anyways... Any of us will lead you there. So if you'd like to help out in that, we got a few up there. Need some more. That'd be a great blessing. But I love you. I appreciate you being here tonight. Any unsettled business, don't ever leave. I'll stay here as long as it takes. And uh, Reuben, you just miss us in a word of prayer, and I'll go back here and shake hands and let everybody know I really love them. Boy, how far we've come. Nick's in charge of our video. Let's pray and be dismissed. We look forward to seeing you here this evening. Father God, thank you for all that you do for us. Uh, thank you for adding souls to the kingdom. Thank you for folks uh, being faithful and obedient to follow you in believer's baptism. May there be more. Lord, quicken our hearts to share you with everyone that we know this week. In Jesus' name, amen.